facilitators properly. If you have a question or comment, type it in the chat box. Um, one of us will read it out loud so that the facilitator can hear. Um, and that's it. Thank you for joining. Awesome. Does that mean we can get started? Yeah, go for it, Sarah. Thanks for that introduction, Tiffany. So let me share the presentation. <laughs> and we just started the recording too. I'm sorry, we probably missed a bit of Tiffany's great intro, but recording started now. And so welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today for this presentation about online garden monitoring systems a tool for community engagement. And a big, big thank you to Green Thumb for inviting us originally to the conference um, and now to have this translated into an online format. So a few Google Hangouts tips. There's a chat window on the side. You can find it by going to the upper right-hand corner and clicking on what looks like a little rectangle. Feel free to type, type in your questions as you have them in the chat. One of my colleagues will be answering them there. Or if it's a bit longer, we'll save it for the Q&A section. And there's also closed captioning available. So if you go to the bottom and you click on the CC, you'll see closed captioning start immediately. So let's get started. So when I think about gardening, I think about my grandmother uh, who had a serious green thumb. She had fig trees and cherry tomatoes and squash. But what she didn't have 15 years ago when she was really at the peak of her gardening was Technology that was at the time only accessible for commercial growers, technology that allowed remote monitoring of gardens and allowed um, gardens to be in some ways connected to the internet or were using lots of different sensors. So the conversation we're going to have today is about some of that newer technology that's creating ways for people to improve plant health, ask questions of their plants that they don't have answers to right now, but also help bring people together. So I'm Sarah McMillan. I'm really interested in the role in technology in making cities more sustainable and equitable. And to that end, I studied mechanical engineering and have worked in cities around the world, helping communities adopt green technologies like solar or in this case, environmental monitoring systems. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, my name is Brianna Garcia, or Brie. I am a new plant mom as of about seven to eight weeks ago. I'm happy to say my plants are thriving with the exception of one. I think the heat wave this weekend put her in a little bit of a, a stressful mode, but we're, we're getting through it. Um, professionally, I have been on the water management side of things, looking at resiliency plans and really leveraging technology so we can understand our living systems and adjust accordingly. So I'm really excited to uh, be able to present with Sarah and she'll tell you just a bit more about uh, Tembu, the company that we work for. Yeah, so we both work for Tembu. It's a company that's been around for several years and we're based in Tribeca and we design products that combine science, sensors, and community organizing. And we do so to help nonprofits promote policy changes, businesses assess their environmental impact, governments to maintain green infrastructure, and help citizens become more involved. Great, so we're gonna go over an agenda of what you guys can expect on this uh, great presentation today. As we've already alluded, how do you connect with your plants? How do you connect with your community gardens online? And then we'll jump into two case studies, one where we have the opportunity to help create the next generation of environmental stewards and how we're taking a classic game and bringing it to real life. And then we'll go over how online gardens can add value to your community garden. Some questions and answers, um, if you've got any at the end, and then we'll quickly discuss how we can all grow to be kind. Great. So we sent out a survey ahead of time. And if you didn't have a chance to look at it yet, I'm going to put that question in the chat so that you can submit your responses now. And the question was, imagine you could talk to the plants in your garden. What would you like to ask them? So let me read off a few responses that we got. One was, how often do I need to water you? It's a common question. <laughs> what kind of nocturnal visitors are hanging out? Which plants do you like being around? Let's see what we've got in the chat so far. Oh, feel free to put any responses you have in there. I'll wait a few more seconds. Okay. 
All right, I don't see any responses in the chat so far, so we'll keep moving. But I think, oh, there's one. How do we keep animals from eating you? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I would ask my plant, what makes you happy? Are you thirsty? Yeah, lots of questions about watering, um, keeping you safe, and, and things that we can't do because we're not there 24 seven, like the nocturnal visitors question. So let's learn a little bit about how IoT, Internet of Things, can help us answer some of these questions. So IoT, Internet of Things, is a technical term, and it stands for the concept of connecting the physical world to the Internet. So some IoT devices you might already be familiar with usually have the word smart in them, like smart watches. You might have one on your wrist right now, a smart thermostat that helps you save energy. And what does that mean for plants and gardens? Well, let's, let's go through two examples of projects that we worked on at Tendu. So one was in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It was at the Agricultural Experiment Station at a local university. And their question for their plants was, like you guys asked, you know, are you thirsty? When do you need watering? So you can see their setup there on the upper left-hand corner. And what they did is install a series of soil moisture sensors. And they did so so they could change their irrigation system, which was set on a set timer, to be actually just responsive to when the plants said that they were thirsty. And that helps them increase the yield. The second example we'll go through was a small company that builds and manages green walls. And they install these in office buildings, in cafes, in lots of spaces where they don't typically have a physical presence all the time. And since there is nothing sadder than a dying green wall, their question for their green walls was, you know, I haven't checked on you in a while. Are you still healthy? They installed a lot of different sensors to find the answer to that question. pH level, conductivity, liquid levels, moisture and pressure. And they also put up their system to receive alerts. So since they aren't usually physically present in the cafes or the offices, they would get an alert and send the maintenance technician to come through and take care of the garden if they started to sense that the plants were no longer healthy. So let's next look through how do we actually design these kinds of systems. So I set up a, a graphic of in a community garden, where might be these different devices there's lots of different ways to design IoT systems, but our design typically has three components, a sensor, a receiver, and then some kind of cloud platform. The sensor. The sensor might be conductivity, it might be soil moisture, it's sitting in your garden and it's measuring the value, sending those values to a receiver. And an important thing about the sensors that we typically work with is that they are not actually connected to the internet. The internet connected portion is the receiver. In this diagram, we have the receiver in a house nearby because that house probably already has Wi-Fi. So you don't have to go buy an additional cell phone plan or find another way to get your receiver connected to the internet. In a neighborhood context, you can usually find someone who already has internet and is willing to lend it to your project. And we'll see an example of that later. But this receiver is a mini computer. It's taking in values from multiple sensors, up to 200, analyzing those values, and then sending them on to the cloud. And it is connected to the internet. The last component is the cloud. And the cloud is this overall term for it, basically just a data center. It's got tons and tons of computers that can process data and then send them to your personal device, whether that's your smartphone or your computer. So in this diagram, we have the cloud sending information that's coming from the sensor then to the receiver back to the gardener who would then be able to pull out her phone and see, wow, this soil moisture readings are saying that my plants are really thirsty. Maybe it's time to water them. I hear someone might not be on mute. Would you just confirm that everyone is on mute in the background so we don't have any interruption? And I might just pause and see if I can actually um, mute that person. Thank you. That's great. So what do these devices look like in the real world? So on the left, we have a soil moisture sensor. This is the kind that we typically use on deployments, but there are many, many others. It has a green, the green piece is actually where the sensor is, and the white piece has the computing components in it. It runs on AA batteries, which is great. Um, and sensors like these, the ones that we use, typically cost around $200, but you can find them at many, many different price points. The next is a receiver. A receiver, this mini computer we talked about, the ones that we typically use are called Raspberry Pis. And you may have heard of them before because they are famously 
these mini computers that change the world because of their price point. They're only $35, but they're smart enough to be able to do things like, in the current context, um, build power ventilators. People are actually building ventilators off of Raspberry Pi. So this great mini computer that can be used for a lot of different applications. And our representation of a cloud server, this is not the data center, but this is the device that you might be using to look at the data on. And you can imagine that the sensor or the receiver, they're typically about the size of your fist or less. So they're actually really, really small devices these days. So in summary, IoT is there to augment your senses. I asked the question before carefully. We are able to communicate with our plants now. As gardeners, we can learn a lot by seeing, feeling, touching, smelling about our plants. But there's some questions we just still don't have the answer to. Is it because we're not there all the time? Or some things are just hard to know with our senses alone. So I put on the right a list of types of sensors that are available and that gardeners are using now. Soil moisture, pH, temperature, humidity, combined nitrogen, potassium, um, and phosphorus sensors, and more. And you can design these sensors to accomplish a lot of different things. Whether you're trying to increase your yield, keep an eye on your garden remotely, which in the time of COVID-19 can be a really, really valuable tool, especially for people who have to stay home and don't have the option to go to the garden, or if you're restricting access to the garden very carefully. And I'm just gonna kind of pause here for any questions. Feel free to type your answers questions in the chat. And my colleague Vaughn will read some um, and answer them. And if you don't have questions now, we have a longer Q&A at the end. But just wanted to pause and give you time to ask any questions about IoT. You have five more seconds to get any questions in, and if not, we'll move on to the next section. All right, awesome. No questions so far. This is great. <laughs> Let's keep moving. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that wonderful explanation of IoT systems in the garden. So our next question is, how do you connect with your community gardens online? Um, I'm going to put this question also in the chat if you did not get a chance to answer the question before the presentation. Um, but this is a really important question, especially as Sarah was alluding to. Not everyone's able to get to the community gardens, but how can you still communicate and how does current times affect your engagement right now? So we will we will uh, give you guys a few seconds if you would like to respond to that question. If not, uh, we'll move on. Um, this is really is a really great question. So we'll give it a few seconds. All right. Well, Sarah, then let's move on. Next slide. Great. Um, so according to some of the responses before uh, this presentation, some are, you know, we connect with our community gardens by Facebook groups. Some people also use some sort of shared cloud system like a Google Drive, a Dropbox, or people obviously use some sort of emails. Um, hopefully your email thread is short because we know how confusing those can be. Um, and then some people even just walk down to the garden to see if there's any signs posted on the gates to see, is my garden open or is it closed? Now, these ways of connecting online are great for local uh, social connection to these green spaces, um, especially right now, only a, a core group of people really have access to the gardens, but there's so many people who benefit and would like to also connect. And that's where these online gardening systems can really expand that environmental stewardship. And again, connection back to these green spaces. Next slide. Great. Um, so as Sarah was mentioning, you know, there's a lot of ways to connect with your gardens. So you can look and you can see, you can smell, but there's also ways that in leveraging some sort of online gardening tool, you can understand what your plants need more on a personal level. And that allows us to not only connect uh, the science aspect of online gardening systems with your shared experiences. And some of the benefits can be along the lines of co-benefits of green spaces. Everything from improved air quality or water quality, lowering that urban heat island effect, which we all know affects every New Yorker every summer. It's a little warm right now, you know what I mean? So these gardenings um, can really lower those, those temperatures. 
It can also help boost pollination and improve the quality of life of, again, connecting people back to these green spaces. And so we're excited to talk about this online gardening system and, and how it works in the real world. And we're going to jump into a case study uh, here in Brooklyn. Next slide. Great. Um, so hopefully you guys have all heard of the Gowanus Canal. For those of you that are unfamiliar, it is a local waterway here in Brooklyn. Uh, historically speaking, this waterway was the main water highway um, for heavy industries in the early 1900s. Everything from coal manufacturing plants to oil refineries, machine shops, chemical plants, cement makers, sulfur producers. I mean, if there was a plant creating something toxic, at some point it was located along this waterway. And as a result, a lot of the pollutant discharge is now in the waterway and it is being remediated with the EPA, but that only solves half of the problem. The other half is having water from storm events go into the canal and also create pollution. So we have the wonderful opportunity to reduce this water pollution with some uh, folks at, down at the Gowanus Canal Conservancy and at, or who live, the residents who live in the neighborhoods. Next slide. Great. So the Gowanus Canal Conservancy in their volunteers um, are interested again in reducing this water pollution and we are essentially implementing an online gardening system in the right of way street trees to again reduce this water pollution. Gowanus Canal Conservancy and, and the citizens there want the same things we all want. We all want healthy neighborhoods. We wanna connect back to these urban green spaces and have people feel part of nature and the solution that online gardening and in-person gardening can create. So the Guanas Canal Conservancy had questions along the lines of, how do we increase community engagement? How do we increase stewardship? How do we take better care of our street trees and all the plants that we plant in the tree buds? How do we expand these co-benefits of, again, clean air, reducing that urban heat island effect? And how do we create the next generation of environmental stewards? And that's where we, again, have the opportunity to uh, leverage this online gardening tool to meet many of these needs. Uh, next slide. So let's see what this online gardening tool looks like in Gowanus. On the left-hand side, we have a soil sensor that's put into a waterproof box. Um, this waterproof box is made out of materials you can buy at your local Home Depot. Uh, the soil sensor, as Sarah mentioned earlier, is uh, about the size of your fist, and it runs on four AA batteries, which can last anywhere from a year to three years, depending on how often you'd like to see the data. And then what we did is we spray painted the actual box brown and then we buried it into the ground. We did this because we live in New York City, you don't want anything to get stolen. And I'm happy to say that these soil sensors have been in the ground since September and we haven't had any stolen. Um, if you also have some sort of closed off area or not concerned about soil sensors being stolen, you can always just take the soil sensor out of the box and put it into the ground itself since they are waterproof. Um, so this soil sensor is sending data every two minutes to the cloud server, i.e. what people can go on their phones or on their laptops to see. So let's take a look at what everyone is looking at. Next slide. Fantastic. So here we have a, a graph uh, from a sensor coming in. This is a temperature graph. Again, co-benefits are really a positive aspect of street tree care or any green space care. Um, so we have the soil sensor being combined with these cute emojis. So at Tembu, we're constantly trying to create tools to connect people back to their environment. And this is the unique uh, aspect that we have implemented into our system, which allows people to document and report their stewardship activities. So you can say on May 4th at 1223 PM, I went outside and I watered my street tree, or in this case, you can use it as a garden as well. Um, I cleaned up the trash, I mulched it as well. And then I took a photo and I can upload it to the graph. So everybody who's part of this online system can see what I've done and see how the trees are also reacting. You can also set rules or alerts. So the question earlier of, you know, when do you need to be watered? How can I help you be happy, i.e. you being some sort of plant? Um, the soil sensors can send 
uh, some sort of message to the receiver and the receiver can text you saying, oh, this ginkgo is at 20% uh, moist soil. I need to water it because it needs to be ideally at 50% moist soil. So you can have that dialogue between your plants and you all in one. Um, and you can also bring in existing information into the system. So you can have weather underground data telling you, you know what, in 48 hours, it's going to rain. So Sarah, you actually don't have to water me, it's fine. Um, you can also pull in information from uh, the New York City street tree map, which is an excellent tool to see not only the ecological benefits of green spaces, but also the financial benefits, right? So it's really starting to quantify how important these spaces are. And so with tools like these, you can add not only the sensor information, but you can add your own experiences. You can make personal and you can share this with everybody, your neighbors and other neighbors in different gardening um, neighborhoods, et cetera. And so that's a little bit of what's going on in Gowanus. Next slide. Great. So here's a second example about someone who loves the game of Farmville so much that she wanted to bring it to real life. If you haven't played Farmville before, you probably are spending your time uh, potentially doing other more productive things, but it is a really fun and addicting game where you have your own farm, um, and then you can ask other people to come help you manage that farm. And so one woman had the idea of, hey, I have this garden at home. I'm growing a few things. But I'd like to find a way for other people who aren't physically present with me to also help me manage my farm. So she set up a few different interesting things. One, the Raspberry Pi, that little mini computer we talked about earlier. She connected it with a camera, but there's a camera constantly out showing a display of what is going on in the garden. She also set up a few smart devices. So she had some smart lights, um, some smart switches so that she could turn things on and off because it smart the switches are now connected to the internet. She had a water monitor, water watering system um, with a motor that could be turned on and off from the internet. And then she invited people to join her on Telegram. Telegram is a messaging app that is has a few more advanced features that, so it's such that you can actually build applications within it. And if you were a part of her community on Telegram, you could water the plants for her. You could turn the lights on and off. And you could see, we'll see on the next slide, live video feed of what's going on. So on that big pink image is the raw video feed coming from the Raspberry Pi and its connected camera. And on the left, she's actually put a filter on it so that you can see which uh, areas have vegetation and which do not, and how rich is the vegetation, and how does it look like it needs um, potentially more water based on if it have that really bright red color or maybe less so? Is that an indication of, of the health of the plant? So, here a really interesting example of using kind of a few different low cost um, smart switches, um, Raspberry Pi, and camera, combining that with Telegram, a free app. Um, writing some code so that she could program it and have now people from around the world helping this woman keep track of her garden. And she really did bring Farmville to life. Hey, Bree, I can take this one. So how can community gardens finish? Did you, would you go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know I was on mute. Um, Great, so how online gardening systems can help your community garden uh, vary in a variety of ways. So one, it can be used as an education tool to connect communities remotely. As Sarah was mentioning the Farmville case, people can water her garden um, from anywhere in the world. In the case of Brooklyn, anybody can log on to their phone and see what's actually going on in the neighborhood. Um, the tools can also be used to help maintain gardens. Um, as always, we wanna make sure our, our green plants are alive and, and well and thriving. Um, it's also a great way to record and share activities, which is really important for, in this case, in the, Brock, um, the Brooklyn case, it's great for the Gowanus Canal Conservancy to not only see what kind of stewardship is happening, but it's a way for them to collect the information that help them get more grants and funds for further stewardship uh, projects. And it's also a great way uh, to raise awareness and conservation of these green spaces. Um, and once you have online gardening tools at various gardens, you can always have a report of each garden, uh, how everything is reacting with spring and summer and fall. Um, the key here is obviously having something that's very visual, 
uh, appeasing to look at, you know, having easy, understandable graphs and visualizations and tools that help people engage in a very fun and um, easy way, essentially. And again, combining that sensor information uh, with public spaces and community members really starts to paint that holistic picture of, of what people can do in their community and how we can expand and share this with others. Great. So to tie together what we learned today, IoT technology allows people to talk to their gardens in new ways. IoT technology includes sensors, receivers, and cloud-based servers. You can ask your plants when they need watering. You can design your irrigation systems to be more responsive. And these devices, the hardware that you need, come to a lot of different price points. The hardware that we typically work with, which is open source, that means that you can use it on a variety of different platforms. There's no proprietary hardware in it. It's also made in the US. Um, typically costs around $200 a sensor, but you can find sensors that cost less and sensors that cost more. In the context that we are in today, remote monitoring can be especially important to help people feel connected to their gardens. And, and even outside of times of crisis, it can be useful for when you have to keep the green walls alive, not everyone can be physically present. It gives you eyes and ears on the ground, uh, even when you're not always physically there. We see lots of examples of how people are being really creative right now, finding new ways to share out their activities, photos, notes, and cloud-based platforms are what allow people to organize. And I guess kind of the newest wave of, of everything is, you know, before there were people who thought about plants and they thought about plant health and sensors and all this. Then there were people who thought about connecting people. They were the Facebooks and the Google Drives and that helps you connect. But now more than ever, people are thinking about how do we combine those two things? Because it's not just people who care about the plant health. It's not just people who want to organize. We want to be able to do that all in one space. And so there are lots of new platforms that let you understand plant health and have a social experience online. And we saw those examples in the Gowanus and Farm Bill examples. The cost of these platforms can vary. Um, Telegram, like we said, is a free app, might require you to have some more coding. Systems like Tempo can cost in the thousands of dollars in subscription fees a year and can be adjusted based on uh, nonprofit status or just the the complexity of the system that you're designing. So those are some cost level things that you can think about and what makes that accessible for you and your community garden and where might you wanna get started. If you're interested in talking with us about online garden marketing in more detail, you can email us at hey at timbu.com. But otherwise, let's open up the floor for questions. I saw a few good ones in the chat and we're gonna let our colleague Vaughn uh, take over um, and answer a few questions that came into the chat. And as you guys think of questions, please just um, enter them now. And I am going to stop presenting now to you, um, just in the momentarily, so that we can see each other a bit more too. So it's a little more interactive. Great. Uh, thank you, Sarah uh, and Brianna. This is Vaughn here. I also work at uh, Timbu. And just looking through some of the questions, we got one question uh, about uh, security. So are IoT systems secure? Um, I've heard smart devices are easily hacked. Uh, that's a great question about uh, security. Um, as Sarah mentioned, uh, as Sarah and Bree mentioned during uh, their presentation, uh, you know, we use a lot of a variety of different hardware devices. They're typically open source, but we only support devices with the latest uh, security and encryption uh, uh, technology uh, within them and also our whole uh, platform is built out with kind of the latest uh, security uh, standards uh, built into it. So, you know, a lot of what we talk about in terms of security is just one kind of some of the basics, like just making sure passwords are reset and everything like that and, and be mindful of who you're sharing credentials with. Um, but in general, these types of devices that we're working with don't present a big security risk because uh, they are built and designed to be secure. And also just given the fact that the information that they're collecting things like uh, weather data or um, soil moisture data from a specific garden typically aren't seen as um, very valuable um, information for someone to invest a lot of time in, in uh, 
and trying to trying to get versus something like a credit card number or a social security number or something uh, like that. Um, and also everything that is stored and transferred is, is encrypted. So there's not a big security risk uh, with any of these uh, systems. They're also not controlling anything. They're just simply gathering data. So they're not controlling a, a water system or anything like that uh, in most cases. Um, another question that I saw come in, and this is one that maybe Sarah and Bree can chime in on. It's just a question about the uh, Farm Bill IRL um, and whether and what kind of any uh, safety protocols it might have built in. For example, if someone tried to tried to um, overwater it. So I don't know if uh, you, Sarah, Bree, all know more about that specifically. Sure, I didn't see that in the. That question wasn't answered in the um, article and materials I read about how she designed her system, but it's a great one. Uh, I can actually put in the link to you if you want to learn more about what she built, and um, maybe you can, can contact her. Um, she seemed like someone who's really willing to share a lot about her project. It, it's super cool. Cool, and there, there are no other uh, questions uh, open right now, I don't believe. So if anyone else has any ones. Um, oh yeah, interesting one from, from Mara. Um, just curious if anyone actually has sensors in their garden, curious, uh, currently. It seems like maybe not. Um, well, if you have any more questions, please feel free to write them in. We're going to have just one last thing. I know Vaughn wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, share all about a new initiative that Tendo is launching in collaboration with a few other groups that's related to community gardening. And then after that, I'm going to hand it off to Mara to, oh, <laughs> how's the NPK sensor work? Yeah, so that one's interesting. Um, it is designed by this, British company. It has basically three different, uh, they look, I'm going to say they're the size of test tubes um, that have the chemistry chemistry system in there to understand nitrogen, potassium, uh, and phosphorus levels. You stick them into the water medium or soil medium that you're looking for, and it actually is, has, is connected to a big uh, little computer, computer system over there. And Anything that's chemi chemistry related, like if you're trying to, to look at chemical elements levels, um, those are sensors that have to be replaced more frequently. So the little test tube looking like things um, are set to be replaced every six to 12 months um, when they run out of, of um, the elements that are in them that help them do the, the chemistry test. Uh, that's about all as far as I can tell you about um, how they go into detail. Um, but I can also share out a link to learn a little bit more about those sensors um, in the email that goes out to everyone, thanking them for joining and sharing the recording. One says, how easily can a system be added onto a garden later on? Do you want to answer that one, Vaughn? Yeah, cool well, thing. Uh, that's a great question. So the majority of any types of, of gardens, green infrastructure plantings that, that we monitor, um, we are um, are already existing and we're adding in a type of monitoring system later on. So yeah, definitely uh, this is not something that needs to be thought of when you're creating or starting your garden. Obviously, uh, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to keep, if you wanted to start a garden and had the idea in mind of incorporating sensors into it, that would certainly help in terms of just uh, you know, kind of figuring out where you'd want to locate these things and having any sort of power sources and, and internet connectivity uh, nearby. Uh, but otherwise, things like doing soil moisture monitoring and temperature monitoring, um, those are all easily uh, things that you can do uh, to an existing garden or planting uh, that you want to monitor. Um, and it's, and installation is pretty, pretty straightforward. 
Um, oh, we have another question coming in. Can these work for uh, uh, hydroponic systems? So yes, it just depends exactly on what, uh, what you want to measure in a hydroponic system. Obviously, uh, you wouldn't be using a soil moisture sensor necessarily in a hydroponic system since you won't be using traditional uh, soil. Um, uh, but things like temperature and connect, uh, conductivity, uh, things like that could all, all be accommodated there. You might be choosing that slightly different sensor just in terms of what's best suited for something that goes into a solution versus what goes into uh, a soil sample. Um, and, uh, oh, here's a good question too from D. What things should be factored in when starting a garden that would make installation of a monitoring system easier later on? So that's a, that's a great question. I think uh, if you wanted to put in some uh, system later on, I, you know, things like is there a easy way to get uh, an extension cord uh, near this place in case you want to power anything and not have to use uh, batteries for that? Um, is there any sort of Wi-Fi or internet coverage anywhere near the garden uh, that you're looking at? Um, and that could be near as in, you know, in the house if the garden's behind the house or just anywhere on the block or, or next door across the street where you could potentially get internet access from. Then I think just other things to keep in mind would be uh, just generally thinking about what makes the same types of things that you do to make a garden just easier to maintain going forward in terms of just like space and being able to access where the plants are, being able to remove um, distressed or dying plants easily and being able to put in new plants. All of those sort of things that would just go into, I think, a general well-designed garden would also ultimately be helpful in terms of making it easier to to monitor in the future because if you have these sort of space considerations and access uh, figured out just like actual physical access to where the plants are and the pots and everything like that then it's easy to go in there later on and you know effectively repot a plant or replant a plant with a sensor in it or um, get a get a soil moisture probe somewhere between uh, the plants and things uh, like that. So it can be pretty, it can be a bit more challenging if you're working with things like if you have like permeable pavement that you're putting all over your garden and then you wanted to know later on, like what's the, the soil moisture underneath this, this permeable pavement surface you put up, then, you know, you would, you would need to remove that and, and get underneath there. Um, but those are the main, the main things I, I would say, like just power and internet. Uh, having knowing that that can be somewhere nearby will just generally be quite helpful. All right, I think that's all the questions that I can see from the chat. Great. I'll present one more time so I can show the slide for crew to be kind, and then we'll hand off to Mark. Cool. Well, um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about this. So this is uh, something that Timbu is involved with right now um, that has that does not have to do with uh, sensors or anything like that. But um, basically, uh, what we've been uh, a few several of us at, at Timbu have been talking about, you know, what can we do? Uh, what can people like us do in the face of this, um, you know, in COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, uh, is there any kind of positive things that we can, uh, can contribute? Um, and uh, the founder of Timbu, she recently, she had remembered this story years ago about um, uh, this woman in the UK who uh, I think got like, you know, lost her job and was looking for a new kind of uh, thing, thing to do and ended up uh, spearheading this kind of local movement to grow fruits and vegetables um, in backyards and public spaces in town and everything like that and kind of trying to create a whole kind of uh, sharing uh, uh, technology, uh, uh, sharing uh, idea and, and movement behind that. Um, and that ended up becoming this whole movement called uh, Incredible Edibles, uh, uh, wherein, you know, 
towns uh, primarily across the UK and Europe, but all over the world have kind of taken it on to uh, uh, have their residents grow their own fruits and vegetables. So what we've been doing is we've, uh, you know, uh, met with the uh, founders of this movement, Incredible Edible, and also with a few other uh, organizations. And we're hoping to basically uh, kind of share all of this information and resources about how people can grow their own fruits and vegetables uh, at their homes, uh, on their balconies, um, in their backyards, any, um, any, any sort of spaces that are available and safe to uh, access um, these days. And, uh, and also if people grow enough of their own fruits and vegetables that they have more than, than they can use themselves, uh, ways to share uh, those back with uh, the community. So it's a lot about kind of finding ways to engage with the environment, thinking about kind of local communities and resilience, and also just kind of a, a nice positive thing that, that you can do that's not reading the news and that's not um, you know just being staring at another screen like you're doing uh, right now. Um, so we have put this all together into a project with several other partners called Grow to Be Kind. And basically uh, the simple website is up now. Anyone can sign up and we'll be sending out more and more information about how you can get started with your own uh, fruits and vegetable, vegetable growing projects uh, at your own home and hoping and seeing where this with where this can go as we bring on more partners and other companies and groups uh, that are working with us on this. Um, so stay tuned. We'll have more to be more to share about Grow to Be Kind uh, in the future too. Cool. Um, I say we've got another uh, uh, several more questions that came in while I was just speaking right now. So let me. Uh, go over to those and I'll just hit them up. Okay. Uh, so here's a question. Um, so what are solutions for gardens that don't have Wi-Fi close by? Are there self-contained solar powered Wi-Fi hotspots out there? Um, I know that there's a lot of work right now that's being, that's happening in terms of like uh, solar powered uh, connectivity and we're actually talking to some hardware manufacturers that are working more on, on basically solar powered sensors and solar powered hotspots like this. I'm not aware of things like that on the market uh, right now, um, but they are definitely uh, coming. Um, so if you're in a garden that doesn't have a Wi-Fi nearby, one solution is actually just, if there is power, you can just power a, a mobile hotspot and use that. Um, and we've seen cases where that, that works fine. Uh, the, the kind of sensor data that is being posted is, is very low memory, so you don't need a, a high data rate plan at all. I think it's also worth keeping in mind that the way that, you know, when Sarah and Bree, Anna, were talking about the types of systems that we set up, often, you know, you can be uh, several hundred feet away from a Wi-Fi uh, uh, network in order to get coverage on the garden. Um, so you don't have to be as close as literally being able to receive Wi-Fi signal in the garden. You just typically need to be within a few hundred feet of a Wi-Fi network, and then we can broadcast a, a radio signal that's slightly different than Wi-Fi to the garden and pick up uh, readings there. Um, so that's that's one one answer for that. Uh, another uh, question from D. Um, will we be sending out this presentation in responses to questions in the chat? Um, yes, this um, this presentation will be uh, sent out a recording, and I know Sarah and Bri will work on kind of summarizing any questions, and and me too. Um, so we'll get you that. Uh, have we considered teaming up with the governor's office to promote to promote this on a broader scale? Um, we've been talking to a, a number of different um, kind of city and state. Uh, agencies and organizations about broadening uh, these efforts. So we haven't technically talked to the governor's office in particular, but uh, we're talking to different groups in the, the mayor's office in New York City and also different organizations at like the, the New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conversation, uh, Conservation. So we're working on that. Um, it's, uh, it's, 
this is, yeah, we, we service people in New York City, New York State, and all over the world. So it's not limited to um, any geography, though we do a lot of, of work in the, the tri-state uh, area just because we are here and we can help out more easily. Um, and then uh, finally, a last question from Mara. This is a really good one. How is the Gowanus Canal Conservancy connecting their sensors to electric power? So yeah, the, there are soil sensors in these tree beds throughout the Gowanus neighborhood. Those soil sensors right now are buried underground and are powered by AA batteries. Um, and uh, they're, they're low powered, so they last several months on a set of uh, AA batteries, uh, depending on how much they're posting, anywhere from six months to a year. Right now they're posting every two minutes, so they last around six months. And that's all about questions. Great. If there are no other questions, I'm going to hand it off to Mara. I just for people who I know a couple of people might be phoned in, so if you can't see the presentation, the website for that was grow to be kind.org. Um, and it's just the beginning. So I think this group is special because you guys are for the most part gardeners. You've been doing a lot of this work for a long time. And uh oh, someone talking about flowers. Um I the hope for this is to to reach uh, expand beyond audiences who are already really familiar with gardening and feel confident about it and reach people um, who might, might be a lot more nervous or just not know how to use their space and haven't thought about it. Um, so any and all thoughts and comments and questions are, are really valuable as we're, we're getting this kicked off and we're looking um, looking forward to, to, to where what it can grow into. Um, and thank you for your for your comment about the flowers. So I will hand this off to Mara. Thank you. Um, we really enjoyed having this conversation with you all. Thank you, Tembu people. This was great. This was really exciting. Um, fun to hear about what technologies are out there um, for monitoring gardens using sensors and the internet and all of that. We appreciate everyone who tuned in today. Thank you all so much. Um, we will send out the video recording today or tomorrow, and we will post it on the Green Thumb website where we are posting all of the rest of our webinar recordings. So check out the homepage, greenthumbnyc.org to find all of our previous webinar recordings and the upcoming webinar schedule. We appreciate you guys rescheduling from the Green Thumb Grow Together conference. Um, thank you, and yeah, that's it. Can we share the presentation with other gardeners? Yes, it will be available publicly on the Green Thumb website so anyone can see it from here on in. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.